Welcome to the Wigton Book Festival and thank you very much indeed for joining us. I'm Sheena MacDonald, I'm a journalist and today it's my privilege and huge pleasure to introduce to you the author of this book, The Lost Pianos of Siberia, Sophie Roberts. Sophie, hello. Thank Sophie's you very much. joining us from Dorset. I'm here in Scotland's national book town. But for the next hour, we're all going to be far, far away. introductory video which seems to have mysteriously frozen Sophie so let's get on with the conversation and I'd like to thank you for what honestly is an extraordinary book I, I it's an absolute page turner and it recounts your the months you spent exploring uh, the territory and indeed the history of Siberia and it's a cornucopia of a book as well find out over the next hour uh, insofar as most of us know anything about Siberia it's a place of, of cruelty, of banishment, of exile. What should we know about it and uh, where it is? Well, that's a great um, place to start. And thank you, Sheena, for that kind introduction. Um, Siberia is as much an idea as it is a place. So I think it's incredibly important for me to first of all explain the Siberia that I'm working with in, 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 in this book and over the last four or five years of, 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 of work in the field. Um, Siberia starts in the Ural Mountains, um, which is that line of mountain you see stretching up through the continent. And it ends, by my definition, on the coast of Kamchatka out there in the Pacific. Now, the reason I use that definition, which is a very loose one, is because of something that Anton Chekhov said. And it was a, it was a beautiful description. He said, Siberia begins in the city of Ekaterinburg and it ends, and he used this phrase, goodness knows where. And that gave me the kind of latitude to go far and wide across this vast territory, which indeed covers a huge nine different time zones. You've got the Arctic in the north, you've got the steppe country in the south, and you've got the great Siberian taiga forest through the middle. You're right, it has a gruesome reputation um, as, as, as it deserves in its deep history. Just by example, 1801 to 1917, when it was the Tsarist penal exile system. We're talking about a million subjects banished to Siberia in that time. 
Um, during the Gulag period, um, 1929 to 1953, highly contentious numbers, but 2.7 million forced laborers died in that Soviet Gulag. Staggering numbers. But, and this is very important, and perhaps I'll, I'll do a short reading just to kick things off here, which um, Siberia is a lot more than that as well, which is what my book starts to explore. So if I may, I'll just read a, a, a section from please the do. beginning. Please do. Siberia is far more significant than a place on the map. It's a feeling which sticks like a burr, a temperature, the sound of sleepy flakes falling on snowy pillows and the crunch of uneven footsteps coming from behind. Siberia is a wardrobe problem, too cold in winter and too hot in summer, with wooden cabins and chimney stacks belching corpse gray smoke into wide white skies. It is a melancholy, a cinematic romance dipped in limpid moonshine, unhurried train journeys, pipes wrapped in sackcloth, and a broken swing hanging from a squeaky chain. You can hear Siberia in the big soft chords in Russian music that evoke the hush of silver birch trees and the billowing winter snows. Covering an 11th of the world's landmass, Siberia is bordered by the Arctic Ocean in the north and the Mongolian steppe in the south. The Urals mark the western edge and the Pacific its eastern rim. It's the ultimate land beyond the rock, as the Urals used to be described. An unwritten register of the missing and the uprooted. An almost country, perceived to be so far from Moscow that when some kind of falling star destroyed a patch of forest twice the size of the Russian capital in the famed Tunguska event of 1908, no one bothered to investigate for 20 years. Before air travel reduced distances, Siberia was simply too far to go for anyone to look. In the 17th century, wilderness was therefore ideal for banishing criminals and dissidents when the Tsars first transformed Siberia into the most feared penal colony on earth. Some exiles had their nostrils split to mark them as outcasts. Others had their tongues removed. Among them, ordinary, innocent people labelled convicts on the European side of the Urals and unfortunates in Siberia. Hence, the habit among fellow exiles of leaving free bread on, windows on windowsills to help bedraggled newcomers. Empathy it seems, has been seared into the Siberian psyche from the start. With these small acts of kindness, the difference between life and death in an unimaginably vast realm. Siberia, size, also stands as testimony, testimony to our human capacity for indifference. We find it difficult to identify with places that are too far removed. That's what happens with boundless scale. The effects are dizzying until it's hard to tell truth from fact, whether Siberia is a nightmare or a myth full of impenetrable forests and limitless plains, its murderous proportions strung with groaning oil der derricks and sagging wires. Siberia is all these things and more as well. Thank you very much for that. And that's an excellent passage to read because it encapsulates the, as I said, it's a cornucopia, it's a tessellation, and you tell so many different stories uh, in, in this book. Uh, let me just pick you up on a couple of things before we get on to the main story. Uh, the wardrobe problem, too cold in winter, too hot in summer, and you know that personally, don't you? Yeah, no, it was beastly, the wardrobe problem. That that line actually came from a wonderful old lady on the shores of Lake Baikal who um, told me off. And uh, she said, you know, she gave me that line, wardrobe, it's a wardrobe problem, too cold, too cold in winter, too hot in summer. And she says to me, just dress properly. I couldn't have been more put it back into my box if I tried. But she, um, I found it really, really hard because in winter, you dress properly, it's fine. I mean, it goes down to minus 40 some of the times I was there. Um, summer, I found really, really hard because of the mosquito, which in Siberian legend, born from the ashes of a cannibal. And they are unbelievable if you catch the wrong season. And I had a very bad allergic reaction when I was working in Kolyma, right on that far northeast rim oh. of Russia. Um, it was tough. But yeah, so I preferred winter. It's also much more magical in winter, to be honest. <laughs> 
Now let's talk about how you came to find yourself in Siberia. I mean, you, you, had a, you have established a, a reputation as a very, very intrepid uh, journalist. You, you go to lesser known parts of the world from uh, the Congo to Papua New Guinea. Was Siberia somewhere you'd always wanted to explore? Yeah, when I was a kid, I had a, a globe on my bedside table that was a light up globe. Do you remember they yes, used to sell yes. them in W.H. Smith? And it had um, this huge half of the globe was this big white space, Siberia. Mm. So it's always been in my head. And then as a teenage girl, like lots of teenage girls, I fell in love with Omar Sharif and, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> and also in 1718, the 19th century literature of Tolstoy and, 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 and the, the greats. So it was always in my head in a romantic way. Um, but when I first um, set my feet on the ground there, it was um, on a, an assignment for the Financial Times, who I do some freelance work for. And uh, that, that was when something clicked and it grabbed me. You know, it stuck like a kind of burr and pulled me in um, and for a very long time and to deep and interesting parts of the territory. You used one key word in your reading, and that is music, which, of course, is a, a, an essential element in the, in, in the Russian tradition and, and, and soul, indeed. And, in fact, it was music that, that was the catalyst for this book. Can you, can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because the, it, it, the story didn't begin in Siberia. It began in Mongolia. Um, I had been going to Mongolia for many years. I've got two sons and we go with our kids, my husband and I, and we stay with some friends. He's German, she is Mongolian, and they have three children. They brought them up in Mongolia in a remote area called the Orkon Valley which is about eight hours outside of Ulaanbaatar. And it was in this in this valley um, above, a, I mean, an unimaginably beautiful, I think there's a photograph that yes, you can think, see. Yeah. And that silver river that, that snakes below, absolutely nothing all around, just the herders. And um, these wonderful Mongolian tents, which are called gares, and they've got the most spectacular acoustics because they're felt lined with a small hole in the middle that the smoke rises out of. And in the summer of 2015, um, there was a pianist playing there. She was teaching some of the herder children piano and um, and she was playing on a, a Yamaha that had seen um, a better times. It was out of it was out of sorts. Um, I I didn't hear it being out of sorts. I heard pure beauty. Um, she was playing Bach and it was on an evening, the stars above, the fire crackling, um, 20 of us or so in this very intimate environment. And I was I was moved and I leant over to my German friend and said, good God, you know, this is really something very special. And he was rather despairing and said, no, 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 the piano is not good enough for her talent. Um, a pianist called Ogdorel Sampilnorov. And um, he said to me, um, he's a storyteller himself, and he said, we must go find her one of the lost pianos of Siberia. And he fed the line that became the book, or became a quest that became the book. Um, and so Mongolia doesn't have any pianos that were, that were deserving of it. So I dipped across the other side of the border, not so far away, and started to, to discover an extraordinary relationship with the piano um, that spread right into these kind of, um, you know, frozen, frozen reaches. And did Franz Christoph know about the lost pianos of Siberia or did he just pluck that notion from the air? Uh, he's German and <laughs> the, the German musical tradition is richly bound to the Russian one. And he had read a brilliant biography, which he handed to me that night, um, of um, it's Walker's biography of Franz Liszt, which talked about a particular moment in Russian piano mania, which we can come on to. But also, um, he also was um, very aware of the relationship of the German makers um, and how they affected the Russian piano industry. So he had the ideas um, in the back of his head. And also there's a wonderful book called Daniel Mason, The Piano Tuner. It's a piece of fiction about a great grand piano going up into the, the forests and the jungles of, of Myanmar, Burma. Yeah. And, it, and it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And, um, and Christopher, Franz Christoph said to me, um, there's no need to make it up. Um, this can this can be for real. We can why not? Why can't we have a wonderful piano in the middle of this step at the head of a river? So it was an eccentric idea, but you know, fun. <laughs> well, now 
non-spoiler alert, if you want to find whether uh, Odd Girl uh, Sampilnarov gets her piano, you will have to read this book, and I absolutely encourage you to do so, because it's a treasury of... Uh, of it's, 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 it's mighty, it's, it's pulsating, it's tragicomic, it embraces fact, fiction, history, and, as uh, 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 Sophie's just said, apart from being a great uh, book about Siberia, it's an amazing book about the Russian love affair with the piano. We'll, we'll, we'll come on to list, but the, 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 the Russian love affair with the piano, I, I presume, is rooted in the importance of music through uh, uh, the human voice, through the folk tradition. How did the piano become so important to 19th century Russia, or Siberia well, in really, particular? It really starts a little bit earlier with Catherine the Great um, at the end of the 18th century. Ca Catherine was a great Anglophile, and anything that was fashionable in England, whether it was gardens, indeed Scotland, um, mm. architects, um, or um, music, she had to get her hands on. And that included one of these very early keyboard instruments, a zumpe, a square piano, that was made um, in London by a German. A German, um, mm. And it, she, that piano rather remarkably um, still exists. Um, it survived the war in Siberia, which is a story um, that you can read about in the book. But um, she started the fashion, and it was her daughter-in-law, Maria Fyodorovna, who went to Vienna and heard that very famous duel between Mozart and Clementi. And she, she was struck by this instrument and she was struck, uh, well, Clementi was quick to act. And he was soon selling pianos in Russia and encouraging his um, effectively performing monkey, the Irish pianist and composer, John Field, mm. Um, to make hay, this is a phrase from a wonderful set of letters which we, we can see, um, make hay while the sun shines. And these, these piano makers, Clementi and, and also quickly the German, um, they couldn't make they couldn't make pianos quick enough, and a piano mania was unleashed. You had in a part there's one wonderful critic's description of sort of round about 1830, uh, who who says, oh, um, if you was a hundred apartments in St Petersburg, 96 of them have a piano in them, and there will be a piano tuner shared among them. So it was a real craze, and Maria Fyodorovna um, also introduced a state subsidy system, which meant the pianos were rather cheap. Cheap. So everybody could have them. And of the bourgeoisie, this is. Well, I was going and, to say, yes. I mean, I mean and, it, 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 sorry, I'll, I'll let you finish, yes. Well, then, then what happens is if, if you imagine Moscow and St. Petersburg completely alive with these instruments, um, at the same time, um, the privileged of those two mm. areas are moving across the territory into Siberia as governors, governors' wives, explorers, and also a few very wealthy political exiles who took their pianos with them. So you start to see this spread of the piano into the remote territory of Siberia. Yes, I mean, the, you were describing earlier the, the vastness, the absolute vastness of Siberia, but th that seemed to be no barrier to, to, to piano lovers who, uh, who were transporting their instruments. Actually, before we come on to that, you mentioned Franz Liszt, and I think perhaps you ought to say a little bit about uh, how he... Uh, electrified what was already a, a huge enthusiasm. Yeah, I mean, Franz Liszt was was the kind of rolling stone of the generation. <laughs> he came in with these virtuosos. There was many of them, and the virtuosos, of course, made it a, 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 a real a real super fashion of a craze and Franz Liszt he was his performances were particularly spectacular because the women would grab at his hair to wear in lockets around their necks they pick up the cherry pips he spat out to wear as lucky amulets and um, it was kind of extraordinary and Franz Liszt did um, give some blistering performances which are wonderfully documented um, in the Russian archives um, so he was a real he was a real motivator for what became a very unique relationship with the piano in Russia. Yes, what I was going to say was that the, the, the vast distances didn't prove to be a barrier to people who wanted to transport pianos, and they did. But how did they? I mean, how do you get as lumbersome a thing as a piano from the Urals to the, the, the western coast of Siberia? 
Well, it was sort of the absurdity of that whole idea that got me into the the idea of the book in the first place. Because, you know, pianos are not like violins. Uh, it's a big commitment <laughs> yeah. to, to, even in this day and age, get one into a room in, a, in an Edinburgh apartment. Um, so imagine traveling three, four, five thousand miles into this hinterland when there was no railway. The railway mm. didn't happen until the beginning of the 20th century, really. Mm. So they used, there was one, there was one track called the Great Siberian Track which ran from the capital all the way um, to the Pacific coast. Best travelled in winter because at least the ground was frozen, hellish in spring when it turned to mud, and in summer, of course, the blooms of mosquitoes. And so these pianos and, and clavichords and other instruments would be dragged on the back of a sledge. And I, I liked that whole idea because, of course, does that not show love? Does that not show commitment? Does does that not show obsession? Well, yes, um, certainly obsession. Yes. <laughs> And I, I, and you know, the wonderful stories of of sort of princesses and mavericks and misfits and the rest of them all uh, pulling these instruments over over those mountains and into the back of beyond. Is it easier to get around Siberia now? I mean, how? In fact, I think we'll, we'll, should we have another shot of trying a, a video and see if it works? Because, but before we do that, how how did you get around Siberia? And did you manage to traverse from the the the, the eastern? I mean, as you say, is is it's, it's not formal, but from the, the Urals to the, the, the far west. Yeah, I did. I mean, the I there is now this wonderful railway that I'm sure many of the um, the uh, many of the listeners and readers of the book will will know themselves, the Great Trans Siberian, and that functions very very well mm. it's it's always on time um it is an incredibly clear line i was jumping it's inexpensive i was jumping on and off using the local trains the cheapest tickets possible when mm. it really worked but as soon as you come off that line you have to you have to work differently modern siberia is very well connected with a, a, a patchwork of airlines um but when you get, go off that patchwork you have to do something else to get around so i was highly opportunistic i had to. I hitched rides with oil and gas workers. I uh, I hitched rides with um, helicopters that were bringing children, indigenous children, back to, to and from their boarding schools. Mm. Um, I hitched rides with snowmobiles. Um, it kind of any means I could, I had to, and that was great fun. It put the serendipity back into the act of travel, and also actually revealed this incredibly hospitable heart of, of Siberians, which I came to have such a profound affection for. Yes, I'm very keen to talk about, about some of the people you met, but should we have a go at seeing this um, video? That's, it was shot by a, a friend of yours, Michael, um, and, and, and he deserves a credit as well because his images are terrific. Yeah, indeed. Michael Turek, he's an American photographer, and he was also shooting um, some documentary work at the same time. A mm. uh, very, very close friend and colleague. Let's see if we can see this.
decimated. Adventurer you are. Um, you said the bourgeoisie fell in love with the, the piano, and many, many of them had them, and, and, and there were R Russian uh, uh, piano makers as well as, as Germans, as well as exporters or importers. Did the man and woman in the street fall in love with the piano? Were they able to? It, that really happened um, after the revolution. Mm. Uh, the Becker fam the Becker um, piano making factory was the was the great grand Steinway of Russia, really. And then the revolution occurs, and that um, factory was nationalised, and it became the Red October factory. Mm. And this was a really, really important moment um, for the piano in, in Russian and Siberian culture because the piano became very inexpensive. Forget the state subsidies that the Tsarist regime had propped up in order to allow more people to afford them. This was, this was a true democratization of an instrument. And these Red October pianos, modest uprights, not a great sound, but good enough, would be just distributed all over the former USSR. Um, into places that you would just never think would have a music school or a house of culture, but they did. And that is why, why very early on when I was working on this, I met the Russian concert pianist, Denis Matsuyev, who was born in Siberia. And I, I, I'd, I'd heard him play at Carnegie Hall in New York and I was hassling him and trying to get his help. And, you know, I needed lots of help with this, with this project. And eventually, when he sat down with me in Moscow, he said to me, um, the audience in Russia is completely different from the Carnegie Hall audience. Mm -hmm. um, they, but the audience in Siberia is different again. And he described their incredibly attentive, suspicious silences because their musical education is very high. Mm -hmm. Of course, with Perestroika, that, is, that has faded, but it's true. So I found this rather wonderful thing, which was when I knocked on the door of a Siberian home and said, have you got a piano? Piano. One, it was very neutralizing, politically neutralizing. I'm an English journalist mm. um, going into tricky territory in the in the time of Putin. Um, neutralizing. It's it's music is a common a common a common base from where we can both find something to talk over the kitchen table. And indeed, it became as um, as a Russian consul to um, an English consul to Russia during the time of the revolution. He called the piano a passport in Russia, it opens doors. Mm. And that was the magic of using the object, if you will, to be able to tell the story about Russia's history and its relationship with the piano. But those that Soviet period and the, 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 the democratization of the instrument, not just for grand concert halls, but in more intimate spaces, um, was something that I found uniquely affecting and um, compelling. You mentioned uh, Catherine the Great's uh, uh, influence. Uh, the revolution was it actually Lenin himself who was the the, the great piano democratizer? Uh, yes, I mean it began under him, but it kept on happening with 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 those that followed. I mean, he and Stalin, all of them, had spent their own time in Siberia. In I know way or they were in exile and, themselves and then survived. Yeah, like, yeah, so, you know, Siberia is always incredibly bound to the psyche of Moscow and Petersburg, but it, it, it was the... 
it was the you know they were trying to bring all these disparate indigenous groups under control as well like any colonizing um impetus and mm. um, the piano represented a, a means to do that as well isn't it because it, it's a it's a it's a european instrument it's a western instrument it signifies a certain a certain part of culture and that's what i also found compelling and a bit absurd is that it was going into regions where for instance one area up in the yamal in the arctic where these people, they're called the Nenets. A piano is an absurdity. They they only carry as much as they can put on the back of a sledge. They're moving 800 kilometers a year um, with their migrating reindeer. Why would, the, why would there be a piano in their culture? But yet you dig, you find, and I found a Nenet composer. Indeed, I found a German piano with him. I mean, it was kind of extraordinary. Oh, you so find very... so many fascinating individuals. I mean, there isn't time to go through all of them, but let's talk about some of them. And people who helped him, and as you say, the the piano and the and the the hunt for the pianos was a, a passport for for experience. And 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 there are there are images of some of them. For instance, the uh, the president of the Siberian Piano Tuners Association. Uh, he he he's, he he was a character. Yeah, he was great. Burikov, he was wonderful, and he helped me. This was in Novosibirsk. I mean, the the, the how did I? Finding instruments in private hands, finding instruments with significant stories, finding instruments that told um, something bigger than just a just a, some, told something more than just was able to play a piece of music. That's what mattered to me, and the. Tuners like this gentleman, Burakov, were key to un, un, unraveling those private contacts. And this this gentleman was particularly brilliant. There was another um, gentleman in Kamchatka who he had, he opened up his notebooks and his notebooks he'd been keeping for 50 years. Every single piano he'd ever tuned and with a story was noted with the serial number. Mm -hmm. And so I had this mm -hmm. kind of archive that just hadn't been touched. And it was also an archive, which I'm sure, Sheena, you'll appreciate as a journalist. It's an archive that belonged to the underdog. Yeah. The piano tuner is never named. The piano mm. tuner is never the star of the show. They come on in the interval. They fix it up. They make it perfect. And the virtuoso gets all the glory. I love an underdog. So these piano tuners became very important characters in my book, as well as leads um, that led me elsewhere. Well, and also, they, I mean, they have a proper conceit of themselves and their expertise. And I mean, the photograph of, of Biryukov we saw there, is that him with the, the Steinway Grand that he thinks was played by the Leningrad Philharmonic in exile? That's correct. So during the um, Great Patriotic War, as they call yeah, it in Russia, yeah. the Second World War, World, World War to us, um, that um, Novosibirsk, which is effectively the capital of Siberia, it's right in the middle, um, was a very important place because um, it had Stalin, while everyone was fighting the war and death on every front, he was building the largest opera house in Russia. And it still is to this day. And it's a remarkable building. And um, and Birikov um, helped me get into the into the sort of story of that opera house, which during the war um, was also used as a storehouse for state treasures. So when the siege of Leningrad starts to lock out, and and they they very quickly evacuate treasures from the state hermitage, from the from the Tsarist um, palaces, including that piano I referenced at the beginning of our conversation that belonged to Catherine mm. the Great. Oh. And they snuck them out on these amazing train journeys going through bombings and bombardments and uh, six weeks, eight weeks, and, and snuck them into the opera house where for safekeeping. That included... Um, the prima ballerinas, it included the musicians, and it included the Leningrad Philharmonic, um, and of course, um, who played Shostakovich's um, great symphony during the war. And the what is fascinating about it is Birikov believes this Steinway came with that orchestra. I can verify it. Um, provenance is hard in Russia. Um, it's hard after such a disturbed history, but he was an absolute key to the kingdom on so many levels. That, you mentioned that the Leningrad, Shostakovich is seventh, the, 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 the Leningrad symphony. Um, is there not a famous recording of that? And we seem to hear uh, artillery in the background. 
but, but mm. was that the Leningrad Philharmonic playing, or was it? No, the... it wasn't. It was I, I, the Leningrad. The Philharmonic Orchestra was taken out to Siberia. Mm. They they played it later. With Shostakovich went to Siberia to hear them play it because oh. they were the first orchestra. They were the ones that should have played it. Yes, but they evacuated because they were considered state treasures. So it was the it was the uh, another city orchestra that performed inside Leningrad mm. during the siege mm. when indeed you can hear the, the you know the um the uh, well there's various stories but one of them is that it was the germans were so incredibly moved by this this music which was blasted through the city on loudspeakers that they stopped the bombardments but yes it was right during this this terrible time oh you want that to be true don't you let's talk about yeah. some other i mean novosibirsk turned out to be a bit of a hotbed of of, of uh, music lovers the, the the lomachenko family were extraordinary Yes, yeah, so this is this slide you see now. They were wonderful. The Lomachenkos, that room they're in is at the basement of the Novosibirsk Opera House. They're a family of musicians. And it's the same room where the Tsar's um, carpet was rolled out for a bed during the Second World War. And in that room, I found um, this man in blue who is in the Opera House Orchestra. He plays the viola. And the man on the right is his father, Vasily. Mm. And Vasily drove trucks in the Altai Mountains, which is a really brutal, cold bit mm. of Siberia, beautiful, but very, very cold bit of Siberia. And he drove trucks and it was a miserable life. It was, it was you know, dangerous roads, brutal temperatures. And it, he was a, a, a brilliant mind. And he thought, I don't want my children to live this life. And so he sold his modest home and with a quarter of the money he bought a piano in the belief that music would give his family a different future it was the belief in education and in a musical education and indeed it did and all the generations you see there um including the the, the little boy um have committed themselves to music and they become incredibly important um characters in my book Kostya on the left, a gifted um, um, tuner, um, and uh, became very good friends to me as well in a, in in the course of my research. Mm-hmm. So this, you you say Yeltsin was catastrophic for the piano, but this family have survived that catastrophe. But what happened with Perestroika? Yes, and glass, well, it's <laughs> basically people were were. The, the economy collapsed, so you sold whatever you could. You chopped up pianos to make firewood. Um, I found an amazing piano that was sold for a hundred dollars. Um, it's it, it was a it was something that echoed what happened in the war. You know, I found another piano that was a beautiful Bechstein that was bought for a bag of potatoes. Oh. But Perestroika, yeah, Perestroika had a massive effect on the economy, and and obviously people just shifted and got rid of things and sold things and and tossed things out the window if they had to move on fast what was very interesting as well of course is that the piano industry worldwide has suffered because of electronic music because of the chinese synthesizer so that was also battering at the bashing at the door um, to, to affect the industry at large but what i discovered is that those who had held on to their instruments um, um had done so with real care and there was a reason for it that usually was about more than music it was about um, family, loved, lost, love affairs, tragedy and memory. And that's, if you like, what I was delving into with this book. It was a, and I will mention it because it was a very powerful influence on me, but Edmund Duval's The Hair with Amber Eyes. Yes. He, he talks in there about how objects are, you know, lost, stolen, retrieved, given as gifts. Um, but it's how you tell their stories that matters. And if you like, the piano is the lens on 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 a, a part of the world that is much misunderstood. And like I say, it became my passport to enter people's lives and understand their their stories. Well, you've told the stories beautifully, and and, and many doughty individuals remain. Uh, who maintained the, the the Russian, to use your phrase, the Russian belief in music's comforts. Can you tell us about the Aeroflot navigator who turned out to be a bit of a piano hoarder in the end, uh, Leonid Koloshin, yeah. who was generous and humane to a, to a fault? Why? What, what was yeah, in it for him? Weird. 
Leonid was great. Leonid was living in the Altai that I was talking about, you know, this quite tough mountainous area in the south of Siberia. And he was a former aeroflot navigator and he'd ended up falling in love with this, this part of Russia um, because of um, a particular, uh, there was a particular influence, somebody called, um, 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 oh God, it's completely off my head now, um, Nicholas Rorick, Nicholas Rorick, who was this sort of Russian um, kind of mystic character. And he was also, Rorick was also a great believer in culture as a way to up, lift people and that just because you were poor or you lived in a remote place you should still have um, access to great culture and Leonid when he arrived in these Altai mountains where Rurik had also spent some time encountered a little boy playing a, a piano that was painted onto a kitchen table and he thought that that was a great pity so he went back to Moscow and brought him back a piano that somebody else was throwing out and um, to the enormous joy of this child Child. Oh, the lights have gone out all over Dorset. Shall we? Shall we? I'll just check with uh, our technical people here. What shall we do? Shall I talk on, or I, I, was that a yes? Read yes, read a passage from the book. Well, I will read a passage from the book because I was going to ask about uh, uh, Sophie's own. She calls the, the, the book a personal literary adventure, and I, I, I wanted to, to describe what she meant by that. Uh, and also, you'll be interested, perhaps, to know that she doesn't speak Russian and she doesn't play the piano. But nevertheless, uh, she, she had this extraordinary, um, uh, extraordinary couple of years, really, uh, researching um, what she talks about in the book. Let me see if I can find a bit that uh, expresses... Uh, <clears throat> I mean, to be honest, you could open it practically anywhere. Let me tell you about... Um... I, I'm back oh, on. Oh, you're back. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that was. I think there was a, a, a power surge. Um, the, can you hear me clearly? Yes, 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 we can hear you clearly, yes. So I'll go back to Leonid, who yes. was the aeroflot navigator. And he said to me, it, in the, he distributed something like 42 of these instruments to children of the Altai. And when I met him, he barely had enough money to buy firewood. But he was building a concert hall with the favours of friends at the back of his um, cottage in the Altai. And he was very funny because I asked him if if he knew of any um, instrument that I might be able to 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 track down for my friend Ogdorel, and he said no. But if you find one, Sophie, will you bring it to? Will you let me know as well because <laughs> I could do with an instrument for my console. And I said, but Leonid, you live so far away. This is so remote. And he looked at me without a smile on his face. He goes, no, Sophie, the world is very remote. We are at the centre. And it was, a, <laughs> it was a wonderful moment because it was totally shifted my, my ethnocentricity. Excellent. It totally shifted my sort of thinking that um, Siberia is the back of the beyond. Yeah. It's not the back of the beyond. Yeah. It's somebody else's heart. I was just telling the audience that um, I was surprised to learn reading this book that you don't speak Russian, nor do you play the piano. Has that changed? Uh, I tried to speak Russian. My husband bought me Russian lessons for my Christmas. Um, it, I found it hard, and I also had to work. Um, I had to work at a level that required nuanced interpreting. Um, so, and I'm used to doing that as a journalist. But I wish I did speak Russian. And in terms of music, I'm not a pianist. I wish I were. Um, but I appreciate music. I love music, and I don't think you have to be able to um, uh, write to enjoy a good book. I don't think you have to um, uh, play the piano to, 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 to love listening to it for three hours. No, well, you, you, you quote Tchaikovsky, who says... Oh, I'm juggling with things here. Who says... Um, well, you tell me what he says, because I've lost my little bit of script. Uh, oh, yes, he says, there would be reason to go mad if it were not for music. Now, I have to say that's very true for me, uh, at this moment, I mean, this period we're living through, without Radio 3, I'd, uh, I don't know what I'd do. Do you, do you agree? 
Yeah, I do. I think that I, 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 there were so many stories where I discovered the solace and mm. redemptive power of music in difficult circumstances. And of course, that reaches right into the gulag history of Siberia. Um, up in Kolyma, which was what Solzhenitsyn called the worst, the worst. Um, it, it, the, 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 this is where the labor camps were utterly brutal. Mm. And I encountered stories there um, of people like Zadaratsky. He was the last Tsarevich's piano tuner, um, a piano teacher. And he had written, I think it was something like 22 little tiny squares of paper. He'd written um, these preludes and he'd done it at a time where even being caught with pen and paper, um, you'd be killed. Mm. Um, so he was he was using music there, even if though he didn't have access to an instrument to kind of hold on to something, hold mm. on to something beautiful in a in a in a in a place of absolute horror. Um, there were various stories like this. I think the one which really resonated with me was a story about um, a lady called Vera. Lota Shevchenko. Oh, we'll come on to Vera at the end. I'm going to pause you there because I'd like to end mm -hmm. with her because she's, I mean, she, she's, I, I, and also I'm, I'm obliged, I'm obliged to, I would like to take some questions uh, from the audience. There's one here from, uh, from Harvey who says, is there anywhere else in the world you would want to explore in the same way you did Siberia? Yeah, yeah, Sahara. There's an interestingly, one of the things I'm glad you asked that question, Harvey, because one of these things that the, the things that this book unleashed was a a um, a series of connections with people who had stories about pianos that meant something to them, either in Russia or elsewhere, and they'd lost them and it meant something to them. And there was one woman who got in touch with me from America who remembered in the in the 60s um, hearing about a piano in the Sahara. And together, it, 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 it was a piano story that made her feel it was possible to have music in a in a in a in the proverbial back of beyond. Mm. Um, and she, between us, we tracked down where she'd heard this story in the 60s. And it was amazing. It was a, it was a, a piano that was encased in plaster. And it was thought to have been taken during the war by Rommel's lot um, passing through Siena. And it was recently, it was encased in plaster and found in the Sahara during that great campaign across North Africa. And it was recently sold at auction in um, Israel. Kind of amazing. So I it's want to, I want to write a story about the lost pianos of the Sahara. But I think maybe I've, I've I've beaten that drum long enough. But yeah, there's lots of places I'd like to go and look. <laughs> you you say that this book is a personal literary adventure. What do you mean by that? Um, personal because it allowed me to really. Sp spread my wings, if you like, in territory. I'm a traveller and I've made my living as a travel journalist for years. And this was one where I could really embrace the things that matter to me personally, serendipity, um, friendship, um, the, 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 I like people, I'm an extrovert, and I like the people I met in Russia through this, through this journey, and it became very personal, it became, I, there are deep friendships that have evolved out of it, and I hope I'll hold on forever. Um, from a literary point of view, um, if I have one regret, it's that I didn't spend twice the amount of time doing it, because the literature in translation is just stunning, mm. stunning. And, you know, to read the entire body of work that Chekhov produced would take uh, six months of, of real engagement. So I'm sad that I didn't have longer because to immerse oneself in the in the books of Russia, about Russia, the nonfiction, the music um, was a really enjoyable part of the whole project. How long did you spend traveling Siberia doing the research for this book? Well, I went the I went to Mongolia in 2015, and then I um I, I kind of got into it in March 2016, and then I I I worked until I had to file the piece. Mm. So I think that was August 2019. Yeah, and the what did I discover is 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 quite tricky. You know, Russian visas are quite tricky, and I did it right to I think I was 24 hours off what I was allowed to have in that period of time. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, well, I, I hope we've given you a flavour of the the, the the complexity and the, the the richness of this book. You mentioned the Siberian uh, tiger uh, country. You actually saw a Siberian tiger. I did. I yes, didn't know there was, was a Siberian tiger, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, the Amur tiger. There's about 500 of them left in the world. And on my second day in Russia, right at the beginning, I encountered one of these wild animals um, uh, in the forest. And it was it was a moment I was with a conservationist. And, you know, you're lucky enough as a professional conservationist to encounter one of these animals maybe once or twice yeah. in your career. Yeah. Um, so he was he was speechless. And when I told him what I was doing with the piano idea, he said, my goodness, if you can if you you can find a tiger you'll be fine on pianos so of course you must do it and he, again he did it with a straight face thinking it was utterly unpeculiar so we have a question here from mary in glasgow is the love for these pianos being passed on to the next siberian generation Yes, in that photograph, Mary, that we saw of the piano tuners with the young boy in the red shirt, yes, it is being passed on. But like the world over, it's um, where, where it's 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 changing. It's changing. If you don't have a piano making industry, something is lost. And on that very um, week that I saw the Siberian tiger in the wild, the last of Russia's piano factories closed forever. And that also gave me a sort of sense of urgency with this project that I wanted to tell its story um, before it had gone from our memories. There are so many other individuals that we could talk about. Uh, Nina Alexandrovna, who knew the USSR like a cartographer. She also knew Eugene Onegin by heart, you say. The, the, the fisherman, <laughs> Valentin Lekus, who sang We'll Meet Again. Uh, and some you've rescued from hyster from historic oblivion, like Sergei Volkonsky, who was banished, but he was joined by his wife, Maria, who took his piano. Yes, that's one of the great stories. And... Um, and 19 uh, it was in the 1825 26 and you had this this what they call the first russian revolution with these decemberist revolutionaries they were the sort of gentleman revolutionaries and they about 100 or so of them got banished to siberia by the tsar and princess maria volkonskaya took her piano with them with her and played it in jail with her husband um wonderful book by Kath, um, christine sutherland called the princess of siberia which tells that tale andrew and from hereford asks are there more portable instruments that are still in use in Siberia? Yes, yes, many. Uh, the violin, of course. Uh, there was a. I wish I could show you and just slip into this um, online uh, um, sh um, presentation the um, uh, image I've got of a young boy who was a, a, a maybe fourteen and a great prodigy. And I've got a photograph of him in Yakutsk. Yakutsk is in the capital of Yakutia, which is uh, the size of India, just to give you scale. And this boy um, is photographed with his violin. What he really wanted to be was a pianist, but um, the instrument was too big for their apartment and um, times have changed. So, yes, violins, lots of violins. Now, you mentioned Vera, so I'd, I'd like to tell us about Vera. And I'm going to suggest that we give her the last... Uh, minute uh, of this uh, fantastic hour um, and say thank you to you for joining us thank you Sophie for writing the book and uh, and, and telling us about it and you can buy this The Lost Pianos of Siberia uh, in the Wigton Book Festival's online bookshop but tell us about uh, about about Vera so Vera um, Lothar Shevchenko she um, was French born and she was a great pianist. Le Figaro described her as sort of one of the great up and coming prodigies. And she married a Russian and they moved to Russia, to Leningrad, um, where her husband was arrested and sent to a labor camp. Uh, Vera protested. Um, so she too was sent to a gulag um, where she spent eight years. Her husband perished. We don't quite know what happened. Um, Vera did not. She came out of prison and she walked into the street of the local town wearing her prisoner's pea coat. And she knocked on the first um, door of the first music school she could find and asked if she could play one of their instruments. Um, of course, they said, and in she went and started to play some records, say four hours, others eight hours, this magnificent school of Chopin, Bach, Lisp. And it was music that she'd held in her head 
throughout that experience in the Gulag. It was music that she had practiced on a keyboard that her friends in the Gulag had carved into the side of her wooden bunk. And I, she then found, she never left Russia, she never left Siberia, she found a future in the academic city of a science city called Akadem Grodok outside Novosibirsk, where I found her last piano. And I also found her last tuner, who rather remarkably had survived the siege of Leningrad. So it was a very moving um, combination of stories around an instrument that had been sitting in a back room gathering dusk. And that, to me, um, justified the eccentricity, if you will, of the whole endeavor, because it allowed me to tell a story that otherwise could have been lost. And so maybe we should play a little bit of her music. It's not a great recording, um, but it certainly gives the spirit of the woman, Vera Lotar Shevchenko. Sophie, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 